Good evening and welcome to our 630 Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we are so very glad that you have uh, made the decision to join with us for Bible study tonight. We know that you have a myriad of choices when it comes to your online Bible study. That's why we always want to make sure that we pause and say thank you for joining us. I'm so very excited tonight because we are closing out uh, 2 Corinthians. And so for those who have been on this journey with us through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, you should look back upon this uh, journey as one that you learned a lot from and, and know that you have read these two books in their entirety and have answered a series of questions that gave you a deeper insight into 2 and 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to jump into 2 Corinthians tonight. We're going to start with the word of prayer to allow us to center ourselves and prepare ourselves for what the Lord has in store for us. And so I want you to pause with me for a moment of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you as we come, Lord, on this, this Wednesday night. Thanking you, Lord, for allowing us to hear your word. Thanking you, God, also for our rising up this morning, God, for our life. Continue to bless us, O oh God, with your word. Continue, Lord, to allow us to hear your word. Even tonight, God, as we go through our Bible study, allow us, Heavenly Father, to uh, experience the joy of having your word revealed to us. Encourage us, O oh God, through your Holy Spirit, and God, strengthen us uh, that we may be better people and do the work you've set forth in our hands. God, this is our prayer in your Son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians, uh, we want to, again, prepare to close out this particular chapter, uh, but I want to also go over uh, just a little bit of what we have already gone through in 1 Corinthians and the other, uh, the, the 12 ch the verses, I'm sorry, the 12 chapters uh, of 2 Corinthians before we get to chapter 13. As you will recall, in 1 Corinthians, one of the primary things that Paul was trying to get the people to understand was the relationship uh, between members in the church and how vital it was. So Paul first started off talking about the fact that God's wisdom and God's knowledge was so much very higher than ours and that as much as we may have thought that we learned or knew about the Lord or about the world, it still did not compare to the vastness of God's knowledge and his wisdom. Paul also went on to talk about the fact that when we look at things going on in our society and in our world, we could learn from the mistakes that people oftentimes make to also avoid those mistakes. Paul went further to talk about the fact that we should not allow sin to fester in our hearts. We should not allow sin to fester in the church. And as much as we can, as fast as we can, we should root out that sin in our lives and in the church. Paul also, in 1 Corinthians, talked about the fact that we all have spiritual gifts given to us by God. That's what makes us the church. That's what keeps us together. And so Paul uh, began 1 Corinthians diving deep into that. In 2 Corinthians, Paul goes a little bit further talking about the fact that we should learn even more about how to be good disciples of Christ, how our bodies are the temple of the living God, and how we should engage in this ministry of reconciliation because God reconciled us back to himself. God took the steps to bring us back to him even though we were a great distance from him because of sin in our lives. How great and how wonderful would it be? Think about that. If every day we engage in the ministry of reconciliation, and that's so appropriate as we talk about now our journey in Holy Week. This is Wednesday of Holy Week. Tomorrow is Monday, Thursday, and of course, Good Friday. And of course, uh, we have Saturday and Resurrection Sunday. But when we talk about reconciliation, that is at the center and core of Holy Week because God did what? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we rejoice and celebrate the ministry of reconciliation in our own lives. And so we, we did those other chapters in 2 Corinthians. Now it brings us to the uh, 13th chapter in 2 Corinthians. So I want us to prepare to 
dive into that with the reading of our scripture tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Let us hear God's word now. This is the third time I am coming to you. Any charge must be sustained by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warned those who sinned previously and all others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not be lenient. Since you desire proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful in you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. We are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed, but we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. This is what we pray for that you may become perfect. So I write these things while I am away from you, so that when I come, I may not have to be severe in using the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. That is 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, verses 1 through 13. Again, I invite you to go along with us in this journey as we continue to study God's word and learn more of what God has for us. As you know, every time that we gather, it is my hope that you learn something more about the human condition, something more about the character of God, and something more about the particular text that we are reading. And so as we come to this 13th chapter in 2 Corinthians, this is the reminder. Paul wrote these as letters to the church. He went and established the churches, but then followed up with a letter to reassure the people of his commitment to them. But more than that, he wrote these letters to answer questions that they had and to address some problems that he heard about that they were dealing with. And so as we get into this 13th chapter, uh, we have some questions that will help us be better people uh, with understanding God's word. All right. So let us now prepare to jump straight into these questions for tonight. First question is this. Why does Paul say Jesus was crucified in weakness? Now, let's remind ourselves about the fact that Jesus Christ represents the fullness of God. He is God in human flesh. Uh, which meant that he had a heart, he had a stomach, he had blood running through his veins, he had a brain, he had uh, all the organs, he had also all the emotions and temptations that come along with being in human flesh. We see this when Jesus is carried off by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tested and tempted by Satan. But what we also see is that Jesus is engaged in doing the will of God even though he is in human flesh. That's important to note because one thing we're reminded of is the fact that Jesus is fully human, but is also fully God, which means that he has all the power of God. And so one might ask the question, well, if he was fully God, how can he be weak? 
This is the central and foundational support of our Christian lives. Jesus became weak for us. Jesus, who knew no sin, who was not engaged in sin, never engaged in sin, wasn't going to engage in sin, became the person who paid the price for sin. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin in order that we may be free. So essentially what Jesus did was he transferred all of our sinful debt onto his body. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions and by his stripes we are healed. What that reminds us of is the fact that Jesus had to become weak so that we could become strong. We were in disagreement with God. We were separated from God. There was a vast chasm between us and God. No man or woman could reconcile themselves back to God. We say, well, why is that, Reverend Love? Because that would require us being perfect and not missing the mark. A college professor of mine some years ago taught us that when we talk about a, a, a marksman shooting at a target, he or she may hit that target one time, two times, 20 times in a row. But if he ever misses it because he's distracted by the soreness in his arm or she's distracted by the wind blowing, if he ever misses that, then they're not a perfect marksman. And that is what sin did for us. It distracted us. It got us to miss the mark. So we know that Jesus is always going to hit the mark. And that's why he could be the sacrifice for our sin. That's why he could be the one who became weak for us to be strong. And so when Paul says in verse number four, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful in you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we live with him by the power of God. Yes, he became weak for us. Yes, he took on sin for us. And that's why we rejoice. That's why we celebrate. That's why we can lift our heads high because our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, has taken on our sins into his body and been crucified. He paid the price. Now, why is it so important? Because God's righteousness had to be paid. We violated God's law. And righteousness demanded that somebody pay for our sins. We couldn't pay for it ourselves, so Jesus did. So, Paul says further down that we should also do some things to keep ourselves from being weak. Question two asks, according to Paul, why should we examine ourselves? Now, examining ourselves is something we all should do. Every day, we should ask ourselves, have I been living according to God's laws? And if I haven't, have I repented of my sins? And if I haven't, why don't I do it now? Every day, we should ask ourselves, am I living as a citizen of God's kingdom? Talked about Sunday, right? The laws of God, right? And God requiring us to do certain things. When we ask the question, how will you receive Jesus? Will you receive him as your king? If you receive him as your king, then you're going to be a citizen of the kingdom. And there's certain laws and certain rules that the kingdom demands. The laws of our city say you got to stop when you see a uh, metal sign that has the word stop on it and is in red background and white lettering. You got to stop when you come to a traffic light that is not green but is red. Those are the laws of the land. If you want to live in this city, you must obey those laws. And the same thing for God's kingdom. 
if you want to be a part of God's kingdom and recognize God as our king, we get to live by certain laws. So Paul says we get to examine ourselves. Verse 5 says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Here's the key. If Jesus is in me and I'm tempted to fail the test, if Jesus is in me and I'm tempted to not live in faith, I don't have to rely on my own strength. I can rely on the strength of Jesus Christ. I can rely upon the Holy Spirit. I can rely upon the power of God in me. I can rely upon my power source. Many of us fail the test because we try to rely upon our own strength. Many of us miss the mark because we try to rely upon our own power. Many of us aren't able to do what God calls us to do because we're trying to do it by ourselves. But Jesus says, even when he was leaving the disciples, I am not leaving you by yourself, but I'm praying that the Father would send you another helper. I'm praying the Father would send you the Holy Spirit to remind you of everything that I've taught you and to teach you some new things, to walk beside you, to carry you along like I did. That's why Jesus told them also, call me friend now so we can walk together, so we can encourage you, so we can cheer you on. That's the importance of examining ourselves to see, am I living the way God wants me to? And if I'm not, what steps am I willing to take to make sure that I do? Final question that we got tonight. What final direction did Paul give the, Corinth, the, the Christians in Corinth? What final direction did Paul give the Christians in Corinth? So Paul is closing out his letter, and he's trying to get them to understand these final directions will carry them on through. Look at what Paul says. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. That's a wonderful final direction. What does God say? Live in peace. Now, let me break this news to you. Who was Paul writing these things to? Was he writing to the unsaved in Corinth? Was he writing to the, to the non-members of the church? No, Paul is writing these to the members. Wow. You mean to tell me Paul is having to tell Christians, agree with one another? Paul is having to tell Christians, live in peace? Yes, Paul is saying, listen, brothers and sisters, if you are going to be the church of God, if you're going to be the beacon of light upon the hill to a dark world, if you're going to be the source of inspiration and hope for those who are in this world and have none, if you're going to be the salt of the earth, you have to live in peace. You have to agree with one another. You have to find a way to put things in order. You have to find a way to do things together. God wants us to work together and not against each other. The problem oftentimes is we've established a line in the sand and we're not going to retreat any further. I've already gone back too far. I'm not going to go back any further. They got to retreat. But Paul says that if we truly take on and imitate Christ, what we do is we live his life. Don't miss this. The resurrection is one of the highest points in Christian uh, theology. But don't forget about how Jesus lived. The cross is the culmination of everything that he did before that date. Which meant when he fed the hungry, when he healed the blind, when he healed the lepers, 
when he called Zacchaeus down from the tree, when he ate with the tax collector, when he did all the miracles, but more than that, when he lived daily to do God's will. That was all culminated at the cross. So then we, in imitating him, need to also take on his ethical behavior. And we say, well, Reverend, you don't understand. I say, I understand. People do what they want to do. And if you choose this Christian life, there will be some difficult things. If you choose the Christian life, it won't always be easy, but it always will be right. And Jesus encourages us, and so does Paul. He says this in verse number nine, for we rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. This is what we pray for, that you may become perfect. So I write these things while I'm away from you so that when I come, I may not have to be severe in using the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Live in peace. Agree with one another. And watch this. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Examine yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you're living in the faith. Love one another. But more than that, seek to build the kingdom of God here on earth. Well, I hope that our Bible study has benefited you. I hope that you have gained some insight from what we studied tonight. I hope that God's word is still permeating your heart, is still beating on the door of your heart and bringing information to you. I hope that God is still revealing himself to you, even yet now while we are here, because in that moment where God is still revealing to you, perhaps you're thinking about something you said today that encouraged somebody. Perhaps you're starting the examination of yourself right now. Perhaps you're asking yourself, what can I do better to live the examined life? What can I do to live the life that God has for me? What can I do to live in such a manner that when people see my life, they also may be encouraged. I want to encourage you, keep doing the right thing. Keep living for God. Keep being an, a wonderful example for somebody else. And I guarantee you, you will live the examined life. Listen, it's Holy Week. I want to encourage you uh, to continue to pray for God's church, pray for God's people. Uh, for those that are going on a Lenten journey with us, continue to pray for persons three times a day. Uh, we look forward to Good Friday. Uh, please join us online uh, for our Good Friday uh, service we're participating in with uh, Pastor Frank Stevenson. And if you want to come in person also, you can be there. We will post the flyer to the Lee Chapel Facebook page today. And of course, join us for Sunday worship at 10 a.m. Easter Sunday morning. Keep staying safe out there. Keep masking up. Keep sanitizing your hands. Keep being socially distanced. Keep encouraging one another to keep living the life before God which you live. And I guarantee you, you will be successful. Amen. Until next time, it is my prayer that God bless you and that God keep you, that God cause his face to shine upon you and that he give you peace is my prayer. Until next time, God bless you.